podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Some of the topics are addiction, fear, faith, self-compassion, relationships, codependency, emotional intelligence, and more. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Creative when you set your goals, visualize them and try to incorporate many of your senses. What do your goals look like? What do they sound like? How will you feel? Imagine the feelings as though they are real now. Are there any fragrances, tastes, or touch sensations associated with what you want? Picture yourself in the moment with clarity. It is important for you to play an active role in your imagination. Do not allow your mind to become stuck with negative thoughts. Your brain is neutral and focuses on what you choose to allow it to. Channel your thoughts and intentions correctly. Meditate on your goal and train your mind to be still. OperationMeditation.com This episode is about active manifestation, positive change, creativity, and other related topics. And my guest is Betsy Muller. Betsy Muller is a speaker, master trainer of emotional freedom techniques, EFT, spiritual leader, holistic coach, and best-selling author. As an intuitive healer and accredited master trainer of emotional freedom techniques, Betsy integrates decades of conventional healthcare and business leadership with action steps to provide practical, cost-effective options for vibrant living, emotional health, and proactive aging. To read Betsy's full biography, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Here is the interview with Betsy Muller. In your own words, who is Betsy Muller? Oh boy, that's a big question. I am a seeker. I would say that. Um, I am someone that tries to live in the present. I'm 60 years old. I live in Ohio. I am happily married to the same guy for 35 years. I have two very well-balanced children. I'm a healthy person. I really believe in balance. My whole life I've been exploring and searching for ways to improve my life and the lives of the lives I touch. The, you know, helping people relax, be calm, present, successful, productive, and aging well. That's a lot of what I'm about. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. You inspired me to ask you a question before my official question. What is to have balance? Well, I would say balance is a dynamic state. Balance is always changing because as you know, when you're young, it's pretty easy to stay in balance, <laughs> at least health-wise. Uh, to me, balance is lot, keeping a lot of different things in some sort of pleasant order. So when I say that, that means your finances, what you can control, you are controlling, and what you can't control, you've given up to a higher power and you're okay with it. So your health, your spirituality, your ability to give back. I put a lot of effort in my coaching with people on fun as part of the balance wheel because I think everybody should be having fun. 
So I'm always trying to inspire people to have more fun and find ways to have fun. And then there's, you know, there's sleep and nutrition, all those kind of things, exercise. But having a career that fills you too is very important. We're all here for a reason, don't you think? And to figure that out, if you haven't figured it out, you know, a coach like like myself, or I'm sure you do some of that too, can help you definitely make sure you're you're going the right direction for your soul's purpose. Guide some other other people. Yeah. Um, you mentioned higher power. What is the higher power to you? And what is your relationship with that higher power? Higher power. Some people refer to that higher power as God. I think that's part of my definition. But I, I don't consider God to be a male or a female. It's a benevolent creator. Maybe that's my best um, idea of it. And, and God is everything, everything, including you and me. So my definition of God is very broad and it's about the energy that we come from and the energy we're part of. Large enough, big enough to embrace everything, right, Betsy? Yeah, that's beautiful. You talk about active manifestation. So this is my official question. What is active manifestation? And uh, my follow-up question is, is it connected to the law of attraction? Well, I'll answer the second question first. Is it connected to the law of attraction? Yes. Using the law of attraction is a way of creating each and every experience and part of life. Active manifestation to me is co-creating with that source, with God. You know, we are not just victims of God's whim here. I think God likes to dance with us. And so my idea of active manifestation is to creatively give God a few ideas and then step back and and see what God determines is the highest and best for everybody. So that's my easy answer to it. What is your own experience with the law of attraction or active manifestation? Oh, I could go on and on, Valeria. <laughs> so my book, my new book that's coming out, I think it gives so many examples of that. Um, and for the listeners that don't know what the book is about, the book is called The Comeback, an Energy Makeover Love Story. And it basically gives a day-by-day telling of a story that involved my husband um, and myself. My husband and I were on vacation in Michigan and One day he went out for a run in the morning and he didn't come back. And later that day, I I had to call 911 and report him missing because I didn't know where he was. And it turned out he had had a cardiac arrest and he had been seen, you know, when he, when he had his cardiac arrest, somebody saw him and gave him CPR and called 911 and they took him to the hospital. And eventually I had to go to the hospital and identify him. And the scary thing about all of that is he went without oxygen for some some time. And so when I finally got to the hospital and finally got a chance to see him, uh, the doctor gave me some really grim news that he probably had a severe brain injury and might not survive, that his eyes weren't responding to light and all that. So that, you know, that's like the worst day of your life when you're happily married and everything's good. and it was a shock. My my professional work using emotional freedom techniques, um, I'm trained to help people manage trauma. And I've been doing this for 14 years or so. But I hadn't really had that big, huge trauma until that time. Um, and so, you know, it really, that day, I still remember that day because the images are very vivid. Um, but that was quite an experience. And you know, you have this thought that either your husband's going to die or you are going to be married to an, a mentally incapacitated person and have to make some big decisions. That all came at me very quickly that day and being away from home added to the trauma. So the book talks about how I prayed, how I took care of myself during that time. And I'm so grateful that I had the tools um, from my long career as a coach for others And also really taking care of myself and knowing how to take care of myself. I didn't stop taking care of myself just because I was thrown into that situation. So little things about asking other people to pray with me and for me, asking for good doctors and good nurses, asking for little things to happen, um, but mostly about always finding something to be grateful for in every moment. So the book 
actually takes you minute by minute through a lot of uncertainty uncertainty that we, well, that I went through, my husband was comatose a good bit of this, how I was able to find peace. I was able to sleep every night. I was able to actually connect with him psychically while he still wasn't consciously back with us to get information. So, you know, some people may not believe that part, but there were all sorts of I, amazing miracles I, I still can't quite explain. You know, one of the things that happened, I remember, I was just proofreading the book because we're almost um, publishing it, there was a moment where I had to sign some papers for my husband to get what's called a tracheostomy, which is when they take that intubation breathing tube out when somebody's not coming around from a coma and they put in a permanent surgical breathing tube. And I also signed papers for a stomach, um, a stomach feeding tube um, because my husband was that bad. That was about two weeks into this. And that's a pretty grim thing to do. I signed the papers because I really didn't think there was much of uh, a way of changing what the doctor said we needed to do. And I resigned to it and I signed it. But then I just started praying and I asked everybody to pray that something would happen that it really wouldn't be needed. It'd be okay. And then I just said, you know what, whatever happens, it's going to happen. And I'm going to be okay with it. I'm going to stop worrying about it. I've done all I can do. And what ended up happening is when they took the the breathing tube out, he did start breathing on his own just fine. And he came out of the comatose state almost immediately when they took the tube out. And then, you know, the as far as the feeding tube, they they thought he might still need the feeding tube. So went back into prayer, whatever's best for him. Um, but they allowed, he they were going to see if he could eat food. I mean, he'd just come out of a coma. And they said, well, if he eats food today, then we might not do the stomach tube. So I said, fine. And I prayed. I said, please let them let me feed him, not a stranger feed him to do that test. And they came in and they brought the best food. He loved chocolate. They brought chocolate pudding, chocolate ice cream, and chocolate like insure drink and ice chips. <laughs> so I had those four things to feed him. And a technician or whatever that came in, she handed me the spoon and she said, you know, he'll probably eat better if you feed him. And oh, I was so grateful. I fed him. He swallowed everything. <laughs> he ate a ton of ice cream that day. And I'm like, whoa. I, you know, that was an amazing day. And I still think about that. I think part of manifestation is to to give God a few ideas about what might be nice, you know, wouldn't it be nice if, but remember, we're not in charge, I'm not in charge, and just say, I surrender, I trust that what's going to happen is the plan, and I can be okay with it, and I really, you know, and then let go, relax, let go, pay attention. <laughs> right. Wow, that's a, a powerful story. You mentioned being grateful in moments like this. So I'm wondering, what were you grateful for when you were in the middle of the situation, of this very difficult situation? Yeah, so um, gratitude is really the first step of the process, I always say. And there's always something to be grateful for. So, you know, an example for me, here I am in Michigan, and this happens to my husband. But I had two of my best friends with me. Uh, Scott and Mary were with me. And I realized, I mean, had they not been with me, it would have been so much worse. So I had that immediately. And then I had a wonderful place to stay because we were booked that night in a and b So after I came home from the hospital, I had a place to eat. I had a place to sleep. It was comfy and people cared about me. So, you know, trauma, a lot about trauma is, is about that isolation. You get cut off from the rest of the world. And sometimes we do it to ourselves. We forget that there are people all around us. Um, you know, so to connect yourself again with somebody who's out there, whether it's a phone call, asking for help. Um, but in this case, I could always find, you know, there was plenty of gratitude around because I had friends. And when you're in trouble, friends want to help you. So rather than go into your little cocoon and have your pity party, which I could have done, I, I remember that to get out of trauma, you've got to stop the isolation. Um, and then that gives you a place to be grateful. You know, some people are going to be jerks when you ask for help, but keep asking for help. <laughs> go, to the, go to someone else. And I was lucky I had people around. But I mean, those basic needs, um, when you're going through a really bad spell, 
If someone brings you food, if someone sends you a card, if someone brings you a flower, if someone says thank you, if someone offers to help you, those are all the little things that you can be grateful for. Ah, oh, that is wonderful. Yeah, so true. So true. Asking for help and and not isolating ourselves. Right. 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 And good friends won't let you. <laughs> I mean, if people know you're going through pro- trauma and everything, but I think, you know, if somebody's encountering uh, a job loss or um, depression, you know, a, a spell of depression, that's an isolating state. And to do some journaling, to think about, you know, f- even look around your surroundings and find things in your surroundings that you love and appreciate, you know, things you, your possessions, things that you couldn't, that you have now that you'd feel bad if you lost, use that for gratitude. It's it's always right in front of you. <laughs> you forget. So true. The smallest things even, right, we forget about. The better. I mean, truly, the little tiny things are the best. Yeah, I agree. Before I ask you, what are the 10 steps driving active manifestation, which gratitude is the first one, let me ask you some questions based on some interesting topics I found on your blog. And the first one is, what is to live in the moment? Ah, it's a very peaceful place. Even when things are totally in chaos, if you can be in the present moment in your body, taking nice little deep breaths, it's like being in the the eye of the storm. Um, I experienced that over and over again through our, our episode with my husband's illness. Instead of letting things hijack you and bother you, to just be present to yourself, go back to your breathing, <laughs> you know, really just, and I, I often find that just putting a hand on the, um, on your heart or putting a hand somewhere on your body, <laughs> you know, and just taking those breaths and saying, I am here and this is part of the plan, just being there. Um, And of course, I teach emotional freedom techniques, which is tapping. Tapping works really good at being present to the present moment and accepting what's going on right now and surrendering to it. That's the present moment. And it's a peaceful place. Two things uh, that I believe it's very powerful. Um, Gratitude and acceptance. They can change everything. Yes. You can't change something until you accept it. And I think that's what sometimes people don't want to acknowledge the current state because it sucks, but you have to in order to allow it to move. Right. To create the space so we can see better uh, the lessons, right? I think everything we go through, it's an opportunity to learn something about ourselves, others, or life. Always. If we pay attention, right? My next question is, What is to honor the truth? What is it to honor the truth? Well, I think we were just talking about it. It is the state of what what is right now. Uh, You know, the truth may come in many forms. So like in the case of what was going on with my husband, part of the truth was a doctor that came to me and said he had just examined my, my husband's eyes and that they weren't responding to light and that there was a significant brain injury. That was a piece of truth. Another doctor comes to me and says, your husband's having multiple seizures. This is really bad. (laughs) He's going to be in the hospital for a long time. That's another truth. But then there was my own truth. There are multiple truths going on. You know, many of us have a sense of intuition or a sense of knowing when we get peaceful enough. And that truth says that everything's going to be okay. Be patient. That's truth too. And then somebody else comes in and wax you with a different truth. There are many truths. Eventually, I think it's each of our job to examine all of those truths and settle. Settle in and accept what is the real truth that it will emerge. And having faith that there's something good coming from all of this certainly helps. That's ultimately where you want to go, I think. But you got to accept what's going on right now. You can't be in denial of it, I think. It's better to examine it, to let it come in and examine it. Yeah, I like that. An acceptance of what is, of reality. 
Mm -hmm. And sometimes there, you know, there are a lot of opinions. We don't have to truly buy into all of them, but I think we have to be open enough to it. Let them be heard. That's what I would say. What is the key to lasting transformation? The key to lasting transformation. Um, you know, so I'm going to put on my coaching hat for a minute. And uh, when I'm working with people, so there's sometimes we work on things and there seems like there's definitely relief. You know, they feel better, but then maybe a week later, that problem reemerges. Okay. And we say, well, what does that mean? It probably means that there's an aspect of what we treated that we did treat successfully, but there's an aspect or a hidden part of it that we didn't address yet. So for example, let's say we were, I was working with somebody on something like um, their craving for chocolate and sugar. Okay, let's just use that example. So, you know, of course, they want the lasting transformation. They want to be done with it forever so that they can lose weight and be peaceful and not have this addiction to less healthy foods. And we might treat the relationship, let's see, we might, well, we might just treat the craving, you know, and, and the time of day they eat that offending food. And maybe it gets a little bit better and they go a few days, but then the, eventually they get a strong craving comes back. So I would always say what, you know, we need to also look at the resistance to change. So is there a reason? That's usually what comes in. So, you know, I, some of the things that I look for is, it's po do they believe it's possible to change this? If they don't believe it's possible, there's going to be a little block in there. If it's part of their identity to have that problem, you know, like they identify themselves as a chocolate lover, a lifetime chocolate lover, and this is who I am. And <laughs> I don't know, then that might be a problem. Deserving. They might not feel they deserve to change, um, that they deserve or they might not be completely on board. They might not be willing to do all that it takes to change it. They may be partly willing. So if you don't address all the resistance there, and there, there's more than just the ones I, I mentioned, it can creep back in. And of course, if they don't even acknowledge there's a problem in the beginning, then that kind of transformation isn't going to happen. Mm, true. What kind of suggestions do you give to those who have those um, subconscious resistance? Because I know a lot of those beliefs are subconscious too, so we are not aware of them. Well, I mean, there are some processes to work with those resistances, reversals. But what I usually do is we try to go back in time to the earliest event where the unpleasant state surfaced, I guess. So I don't know if we use a fear of public speaking, let's just say, let's pull that one as a possibility. So, you know, if they, if they're working with me and we determine that they really want to do public speaking, they deserve it. They, they're willing to do what it takes, all those different things still feels like it's blocked, sweaty palms, you know, the voice gets choked up or whatever. I would ask what, you know, can you find a, a time, the earliest time in your life when you noticed this was happening find your, and notice the feeling, the body feeling, the emotional feeling. And it doesn't have to be related to public speaking necessarily. Find the earliest time when you had this feeling, go back in time. And that's probably the point that a specific event allows us to examine uh, the formation of a core belief way back then. And then we play with the core belief. We find other events that are related to that core belief and examine those as possible areas to forgive, let go, transform, going back, working on that. Wow, traumatic learning is so difficult <laughs> to unlearn, right? Uh, but possible. Yeah. 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 And some people call it PTSD because sometimes it really is pretty traumatic. Um, things in childhood too tend to be, um, the memory gets coded in somewhat of a flawed way because the child doesn't really understand the full implications of what happened. And even, you know, things can be misinterpreted. I, I was just working with someone last week who, it was actually on, on a public speaking issue and an event from when she was eight years old came up where she felt she was in a situation where her 
uh, a family member, a sibling, an older sibling, um, she observed that sibling being threatened by her by the sibling's husband, and uh, he actually threatened to kill her sister right in front of her. And um, she was deeply traumatized. I don't know how ser- you know whether the guy really meant it or not, but the child heard it, and the child spoke up to her parents about it, and they ignored her. And um, she really shut down her voice and didn't feel like she could be respected when she spoke up because of this event. And so we went back and we worked with that event. And actually, I didn't work on it. One of my students um, worked on it with her. I'm reviewing cases right now, so I shouldn't take credit for this. But, you know, I, I did talk with the practitioner and my student that had this happen. So it was a, a very, very powerful healing. This woman that had the ability to let that go has moved on in her career now. She's very comfortable in meetings. She's speaking up and she's like, she's kind of in awe that letting go something from your eight-year-old past would make such a powerful transformation to the present situation. Oh, yes. Mm, Because it holds us back in many ways, those things. The next question is, what is enlightenment to you? You know, enlightenment can happen every single day. It's about paying attention. And to me, it's noticing the goodness around you and also noticing ways to be of service. To me, I think that's that's what enlightenment is. You see how you fit into the world. You observe how the world works and even have a sense of awe of how it all works. Uh, enlightenment involves that sense of awe um, that life is a mystery and it's unfolding in mysterious ways. And we don't have to understand everything. But enlightenment is about curiosity and being present to the unfolding of the mystery. And being right there, like, cool, let's watch the mystery. Instead of being afraid to be curious and in that, that awe filled state. Yeah, I mean, I always, you know, I, I hold a woman's retreat every year and I always tell my retreat participants when we first get together, there's a, there's a few rules. Well, not really rules, I should say guidelines, but I say, be a witness, not a judge. And being a witness allows you you to just take it all in. You can see what other people are doing. You can see their pain. You can see their transformation because sometimes they don't see that they've transformed right in front of you. Um, So you can be a witness to someone else's healing. You can be a witness to their goodness. You can help them see who they are. You know, I think this witness state, which is part of enlightenment, um, you know, being a student of reality and a student of possibility. And that's that's enlightenment. Going back to the topic of active manifestation, here's my last question on the topic. What are the 10 steps driving active manifestation? Okay. Well, we already already covered number one, and that's really taking note of everything to be grateful for. And I say, you know, write down at least five things every day that you're grateful for. There's always something there. And writing them down just makes it a little more... Uh, obvious. Number two is choosing something that you desire or that you want to create in your world and, you know, getting clear, a a little more specific about what you're wanting to create. So say like I'm writing a book right now. So, you know, with this book, what do I want to create? Um, Measurable, detailed, clear, money, time oriented. But why am I, why am I even bothering with this thought? You know, so you know, getting clear, what's the big why? You know, because you use energy when you manifest something, when you have this desire. So so getting clear. And sometimes, you know, again, journaling is a really good place to get clear. Uh, step number three is to create the picture, the image. I really think uh, that because we live in a physical world, we need to take that thought and start really seeing it, hearing it, feeling it, um, expanding the vision of what's coming that we are we are presenting to God as a possible co-creation. You can draw this. You can make a picture. You can find pictures. You know, vision boards are are a possible way of doing this. Um, oftentimes, I'll be meditating, and I just want to, you know, I just see a vision, and I also expand that vision to say, who else is in the picture? Who else could benefit from 
what I'm envisioning. So when I've envisioned the book, I think of people reading the book, benefiting from the book, maybe reaching out to me because they've read the book, asking a question, maybe being in an audience when we, when we do a, a talk or a book signing. So I see that. I see my dog going with me because I have this one little therapy dog named Serena. You know, so I mean, I, and you just embellish the picture. You add times of day and climate and places and you use all your senses. Um, you hear music. You see yourself in this picture. And then number four is to check in on the resistance. So is in spite of everything you've created in this lovely vision, there's going to be this part of you that says, yes, but, or who are you to do that? Or what, you know, who do you think you are? God? <laughs> You'll hear these voices and they come from authority figures from your past or some horrible bully. I mean, but you let them rip, hear them. Okay. Because that helps you know what you need to still release or change or overcome in order for number three, that picture, to emerge more fully and completely into the dominance of what's possible, okay? So some people may think number four is negative thinking. I think it's realistic thinking and it is clearing the path. So you might as well get your your weed whipper out and clear the path, right? Right. In a way, addressing the negative response, right, to the uh, imagination, the imagined uh, image, right? And I think, you know, some law of attraction people would say, oh, you should never um, open up yourself to those negative thoughts. I adhere to that to some extent, but yet when you do emotional freedom techniques tapping while you admit negative things, I don't just let negative things rip. I pick a special specific time and I clear it in a safe place using a process that I know works for clearing that. And then I lock up the system again. You won't see me out and about in the world talking negatively about my dreams ever. And even when my husband was in the hospital and things were pretty grim, I wrote on Facebook every day to my community. Um, I never expressed the grimmest thoughts that, that were living inside of me. I waited to do that when I was by myself. So I conveyed words of hope a little bit and I asked people to pray for certain things. Um, but that's an example of being careful. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah. Right. Not giving force or energy to the um, negative thoughts. You don't give life to them. You need to be in a safe place, in a protective place to open that up. That's it. And so that's number Number five, treat your negative thoughts to reverse thinking. And I always say use EFT because it reeks really well. So you go, even though I'm terrified about this, I deeply and completely accept myself. And you repeat that setup statement three times and then you tap the tapping points as you focus on the negative state. You don't switch to the positive state till you've fully cleared that negative state and feel neutral. And there's a lot, you know, I don't have time to teach EFT to the the podcast audience today, but there's tons of information and videos on my website. And, and so if you share that with people, they can find. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I will. The link. Yes. So after you treat your negative thinking, then step number six is entering the matrix. Ooh. <laughs> and I say you time, time travel fast forward into the future. So you kind of already did that when you created that picture. But now that you've taken the resistance out, it's a good time to to just fast forward and imagine a memory of a future of the future that you've created and that triumphant feeling. Just go right into it. Use all of the senses just as you did as you did that picture, but actually see the memory of it. See the beauty of it. Describe the physical feelings that you feel as you're you're in it. So that's that's a powerful one. I have a question, Betsy. How do we balance living and being in the present moment while enjoying these uh, future good memories? <laughs> this manifestation work, I think, is done in a private place where you're kind of, you're not going to be interrupted and you're, you're really focusing on the future. When you're done with doing this, this inner work and this visioning, you seal it up and you let it go. And you go back to the present moment in the real world 
without hanging on uh, necessarily. I like to capture all these things in a journal or something so it can stay there. You can even envision putting all of this into a special container, sealing it up and holding it somewhere. But you do have to return to the present moment and life as hectic as it is. You know, I mean, every day I had to get up and go to the hospital and hear these doctors tell me gloom and doom. And it wasn't pleasant, okay? The real world can be unpleasant and it'll knock you right on your fanny and then you have to find your center again. Um, that's the challenge. That's life. True. So in a way, uh, having these memories of the future and enjoying them, it's like uh, planning, being here now, planning something. Because we normally do that anyway. Yeah. And sometimes you can co-create that with another person. I remember my my best friend Mary. We're in the we're in the IC we're in the ICU together. She pulls me aside and she she said, "Let's man, let's imagine this right now." And she said, and she gave me the vision of our favorite patio where our, she and I and our husbands would go, you know, for dinners on Sundays or on summer evenings. And she said, "I see us back there. We're going to be back there this summer before this summer's over." We're going to be out there together having dinner. And I thought in my rational mind, well, that's so ridiculous. And then I thought in my envisioning mind, that's possible. And you know what? I'm happy to say it, it happened. And we, but we visioned it and then we let it go, whatever. But three months later, they let him out of the rehab facility for an evening and we got out there and nobody had any clue there was anything wrong with him. And we had a lovely dinner and he had a steak. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Wow. Yeah, that's really great. It's hard to believe right now, but a lot of miracles came together. Right. I like that. So another question came to me just now. How do we know we are not into this uh, unrealistic and wishful thinking ideas like living just a fantasy? So, you know, maybe that takes us to number seven and eight in my manifestation list. Number seven is about sharing your desires and creation plans with a witness or witnesses. I think it is a good idea to check in with the real world. And it's also really good to verbalize those dreams out loud without being afraid, you know, to some good people to hear them. Because if they're really crazy or ridiculous, people might clue you in like, really? Um, on the other hand, they may give you some new ideas or they might just fully support you and say, I'm going to pray with you on this, Betsy, you know, and will you listen to my dreams? I think, you know, creating the energy with other people to support your dreams. And I did that with my husband's health and healing. I was very vulnerable. I went, you know, I used social media. We had hundreds and hundreds of people from all parts of the world praying for him and tuning in. I mean, you know, people are all over now wanting the book out because they're like, I want to read the book. I knew some of the story, but I didn't know everything. And and so it, it's kind of exciting, but they'll amplify, but they'll help fine tune it. Um, and I think, you know, saying things out loud with your voice, even if you don't have someone there, kind of gives it, it helps temper the reasonableness you hear it, you embrace it, you might fine tune it a little bit. And the step eight of the process is very important too. Determine the action steps you must take. You know, we manifest or we dream these things and often there are things we can do. We we might convince ourselves that it's all up to God, but actually we can do some things. We can line some things up. Part of this is asking for help, looking for resources, taking time to determine how you how your end of the responsibility looks. You know, do you have to be brave? Do you have to step up and introduce yourself to a stranger? Do you have to do some self-care to to be ready to handle what's coming? Yeah, I like that. You know, I heard uh, yesterday I interviewed somebody who said something to me I never heard before and never read anywhere. I said, what about responsibility? I think we're talking about being happy all the time and joyful. And then she said, um, you know, the word responsibility really means the ability to respond to whatever needs to be responded to in our lives, showing up for something. So, yeah, that's, that's beautiful. I like that. 
Yeah. I mean, we, you know, like I'm thinking somebody might want to manifest something, but they're not sleeping enough, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yes. How are they going to do it if they're not sleeping right and eating right? You know, their body isn't going to be able to handle what's what's coming. They might miss it. They won't be able to respond, uh, you know? So th- when we feel like we don't have power, we have to remember there, there are a lot of things we do have control over, especially self-care. So that's a big piece of it. I agree, hundred um, percent. That was number eight. Yes. So number nine is developing positive affirmation statements. So only after you've really cleared away the crud, <laughs> I, I, people jump into affirmations often too soon before they've cleared away the resistance. But once you've cleared that resistance away, you're imagining things. The best affirmations affirm exciting things like I am enjoying blank or I am celebrating blank. Those are some of my favorite affirmation statements. So whatever you're creating, envision and use the words, I'm enjoying it. I'm celebrating it. uh, I'm there. And then number 10, what's number 10? Oh, select an image or an icon to present the achievement of this goal. Sometimes it's just you know, it could be just a symbol. It could be a letter with a, you know, a little halo around it. It, it could be a lot of different things, but it's nice to have a, a touchstone, a reminder, even a single word. Um, sometimes I use a single word concept with my clients to help anchor um, the vision of what they're doing so that it's easy. Wow. The conversation has been really meaningful. You talked about resilience, one of the things that really resonates with me. Resilience and purpose, all these um, steps for active manifestation. I love that. Thank you so much, Betsy. Do you have anything else to say about this topic? I want to ask you other questions related to uh, well-being. They are more philosophical questions. I'll close up. So... My advice for anybody out there, young or old, ask for what you need, accept what shows up, integrate what shows up into your present moment, and last but not least, don't put off your joy till later. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Because it's available now and uh, you might as well be having some fun. That F word. Don't put that at the bottom of your list. Put it at the top and fulfill those goals and you'll probably find that your other goals get taken care of. Do you see any difference between um, joy and happiness? Happiness. I, I see joy at a higher level above happiness. Joy is really like a bubbly feeling that's that bubbles up from your heart. It goes a little higher. That's how I experience it. Right. And happiness, would that be related to uh, external experiences and pleasure? I don't know. I, you know... I just see them energetically. So it's kind of funny. Like I joy is, I feel like a little kid opening a present. <laughs> <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. And happiness is just kind of everything's right there in front of you and it's all good. Does that, I don't know. That's a distinction of the energy. The energy is much more vigorous in joy in terms of the way I feel it. And there's nothing wrong with happiness. But I'm always looking for a little lift above happiness. There's more. There's more beyond it. It may not, joy may not be connected to only external things. It might be being happy for no reason, really. The pure gratitude of being alive. Yeah, it's like this giddy, you know, just laughing to yourself feeling. (laughs) That's what it is. (laughs) (laughs) That makes sense to me. Um, So... That will lead me, that question leads me to the other questions, philosophical questions. How do you define spirituality? Um, I think it is having something beyond you that you regard as wonderful and powerful. So it's beyond yourself. It's a connection to something bigger than you. Do you see a difference between spirituality and religion? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I was raised in the Methodist faith and I had a lot of good experiences. A lot of people that I, I have worked with over the years have had some very traumatic experiences because of the authoritarian nature of their religious 
or upbringings or religious dogma placed upon them or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think, I think spirituality never has any fear involved with it. That's what I would say. And religion can, you know, can be beautiful too. I, I see so much beauty in the religious teachings, but there can also be a dark side of it. I don't see any dark side in spirituality. Um, what is another word for healing? Uh, transformation or transcendence. That's another good one too. What is love to you, Betsy? Oh, you know what? There you go. That's like one of those words, like if you tell the kid about a bird. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> will never see love again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, love comes in so many forms, whether it's your love of pie or your love of your little doggy or your love of your spouse or your love of good movies and, and great songs. And, you know, love to me, again, when I talk about that feeling, it is that giddiness, that happiness, it, it beyond happiness feeling. It, but it's awe, it's beauty, it's and it's so much of our earth, earthly experience. It's the beauty of our earthly experience. We get to do that, but it goes beyond physical. So I think it's what connects us to all times and all possibilities for our soul. Love doesn't go away. It keeps building. We accumulate it and we take it with us wherever we go. Once we have it, we don't lose it. Mm, yeah, I believe that we all have that love that you just spoke of, but we just sometimes we are not aware of it. I think fear gets in the way. Well, and, you know, losing things like death, you know, it's an illusion that we've lost love. We've lost a person that matters. We have this attachment, but yet we didn't lose that. It's transformed. It's changed form. When you can get past the grief, you realize the love's still there. Many of us can communicate with those that have moved to the other side. Once we're in a better state of having processed that grief, we can connect with it again and realize the grief is there because it was love and that it is love. It just changed forms and we were shocked by the form change of it. How do you define success? Oh, that depends on whatever you whatever you decide i have my own decision on what success is and so do you and it's all okay to be different so some people it's all about accumulating money other people it's about experiences it's very individual and our society defines it to some extent but at the end of the day each individual has to decide what that is and pursue their own version of it yes i agree what is success to you to me, well, it, I think it takes us back home to the the whole notion of balance. Having some notion of how you want to live your life, not necessarily controlling everything, but but adhering to practices that keep you on that path and having ways to get back on the path if you got bumped off, you know, and that's a pretty good way of thinking about it, I suppose. And knowing that it's going to change, it's always going to change. Because uh, we don't run the show. <laughs> no one of us runs the show. So we got to be ready to, to go with the show. What was the hardest lesson to learn about yourself, others, and life? The hardest lesson? Hmm. It's always hard when you lose something. I, I, I just had a dog pass away last year. I mean, you know, dogs don't seem like they're that big of a deal. I, my parents are still living, so I haven't had that loss yet. Those are hard lessons because that transformation, it's still, we fight it. The other hard lesson that I'm still um, handling is my mother has Alzheimer's. You know, she's left us her, in her previous form. She's not with us in that form anymore. She's still alive and with us in her current form. I challenge myself all the time to accept what that is, to be present to her the way she is right now. And also to manage my own feelings about the loss that I guess the rest of the world doesn't quite see as a loss yet because I'm so close to it, to examine it and to grieve it. It's like losing before you really lose somebody. Yeah, it's really complicated and it's sad. And then there's the, the part of it that says, well, Betsy, you might have that because she's your mother. 
Um, so I, I, you know, something I'm very curious about, open to, is brain health after what my husband went through, and also my mother is still going through, and um, being an advocate to help that situation for the generations to come. That's wonderful, yeah, that you are open to learn so you can help yourself and others. Exactly. That's great. What is to be strong? Hmm, to be strong. I think it's doing the best you can. Sometimes it's just just get up and keep keep going. Um, being strong is fulfilling your commitments, I, you know, or gently bowing out and admitting when you can't. Um, being strong means having boundaries instead of just caving in to what the world's demanding of you too. So I think it, it, it takes many forms. Boundaries are important. Speaking up is important. And, re- and surrendering is a place of being strong too. And you can be vulnerable and strong at the same time. I truly believe that um, vulnerability is a strength. If you knew you would die soon, would you change anything about your life or do anything differently? I'm looking around my desk as a mess. I think I would want to clean my desk up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's that's good. <laughs> Other than that, no. I, you know what? I've always said I'm ready to go when the time comes um, because I'm not really... I'll still be around. I'll just be in a different form. But actually, you know, because of what happened with my husband, we really did get our affairs in order. We even planned our funerals last this year. Yeah, we paid for them and everything. So it's done. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You wouldn't do anything differently? I don't think so. I think it's going pretty well right now. Yeah, we've been doing a lot of traveling Um you know, like I said before, don't put off the fun. Um, so we, we find a way to just get out there and see new things. And it's like a real priority now is to have a few adventures every month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds so good. <laughs> I know you believe in life after death um, and the kind of idea you have is that uh, transformation. Do you have um, some beliefs that we will um, reincarnate or live in a sort of paradise after here? Uh, About reincarnation? Well, well, I think the best part of reincarnation is actually the time between lifetimes when you get to go back and hang out with your soul group. Uh, You know, and all the people that you've loved on planet Earth are going to be there. So it's like a big reunion with and lots of laughter. I'm quite sure about all the silly things that we put each other through when we were in physical form. I'm quite certain that you know, I think there is a choice whether you want to be incarnated again or whether you stay with your soul group and ascend to the angelic realm or whatever. I'm pretty sure I would come back here again just because I really love planet Earth. Wow, that's interesting. Even though life is comprised of a lot of suffering, necessary and unnecessary suffering, that's very interesting that you're still okay with the idea of coming back. You know, it's an illusion. I mean, the suffering is very real in the physical world and it's painful and it's so hard to watch. But you know, once death occurs, there's a transformation. There's no pain. It's all returning to that place of love and you're renewed and you're loved and you realize that you never lost it. But we we do get stuck in the illusion here. It's so easy because the physical world is tough, but it's an illusion. We get to go home. Over and over again. Uh, I'm just wondering why we keep coming back then um, if we've already experienced um, the physical form and uh, whatever we uh, wanted to experience. Do you think our desires to uh, experience more, like you just said, I love in here, I want to come back. That's the reason probably we keep coming back. And also, I think, you know, everything that I just talked about, about manifesting, I think some of us manifested lifetimes without thinking them through. I think every time we come back, we think them through a little bit better to make it better. You know, so maybe the next time you come back, you make sure Archangel Michael is assigned to you personally (laughs) or or some (laughs) some being like that. (laughs) So you always have really good protection and that you ask in the next lifetime to be paired up, you know, as a significant uh, support system. I, I don't think we just blindly, you know, get deposited on the earth unless we're not advanced enough spiritually to even know that's possible. I definitely 
think I have enough consciousness now that I the next life will be much more deliberate than this one. And I think I, I manifested a pretty good one this time around. I'm still in awe of how well things have worked out. I have faith and I, I love planet Earth. Look around. It's so beautiful. It's so green and sunny right now. And and I love I love little dogs. I don't know if they're all in heaven. I think they're in heaven too. What? <laughs> That is so cute. Uh, yeah, I really, I think that our beliefs um, are the ones, whatever we believe in, it will manifest. Yeah, the mind's really powerful in that sense of creating, becoming. Um, my last question to you. What are three things about life, this life, you know for sure? I know for sure that we are co-creators, that we can manifest, um, that our thoughts, good or bad, are making things happen. I have so much evidence of that. I know for sure that many of us that we're with right now, we've been with before and it's playing out again. And I know, the third thing I know for sure is that healing, even when you don't think it's possible, is possible. Especially healing things from the past that have plagued you for years, that have been mysterious for years, can heal. I know that. Really great. Thank you so much for your presence, Betsy. Well, thank you. Yeah, it has been a meaningful conversation. Where can we find more information about you, your work, your books, service, and future projects? All right. Well, you can find me on social media, on Facebook. Create and Connect Brilliantly is my Facebook page or personally under Betsy Muller. I have a website, createandconnectbrilliantly.com. And the book... Um, has a Facebook page too. It's The Comeback, an energy makeover love story. And it should be available on Kindle within the next two or three weeks, I'm expecting. And then there will be um, a hard copy book coming shortly after that, but it'll start on Kindle. Really great. Thank you so much again. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Valeria. Bye for now. Betsy. listening to learn more about Betsy Moller, please visit her website create and connect brilliantly.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org/podcast. I want to thank the Patreon members, Lawrence McGrath, Mark Basden, Terry Clayton, and Aidan Bickrock. Thank you again for listening, and bye for now.